Now, as we get to this message today, for anybody that's new to CBC, we've been in a series all summer long in Exodus chapter 20, talking about the Ten Commandments. We are commandment number nine. So for anybody that's new here today that was invited by somebody, your friend or family member, I always got to give this disclaimer, especially in this particular series, because it's, little, it's a little bit heavy in regards to these messages. Your family and friend, coworker, classmate did not invite you because you have a, a lying problem, all right? <laughs> this is the ninth of Ten Commandments that we've been looking at sequentially, step by step, been walking through this. But I just want to say this to each and every one of us. This sermon series has been such a revolutionary mindset developing in my own heart. I'll never look at the Ten Commandments ever the same again. And I hope it's been a blessing to you. It's caused us to say some hard things, receive some hard things. But I'm proud of a church that would just have this mentality. Thank you, Pastor Ed, for punching us in the face with the message. We'll be back next weekend. And that's what I love about you. I absolutely love this about you. But just in case there's a mindset of, okay, he's preaching at us. I need you to know I'm a fellow struggler. I'm really just preaching at myself. I'm just glad you're in the room. These are things I got to work on. I'll never stand in front of you and pretend like I got it all together. I'm not the bonic believer that jumps from one tall building to the next. These messages, I'm trying to live out myself, seeking to be held accountable, just like you. But as we talk about this message of lying, I want to share a message entitled, Liar, Liar. In 1997, there was a film that came out, Jim Carrey, you remember this particular film? For one day, he had to tell the truth, and it was painful to watch. It caused all of us to begin to just think through this. What if all of our thoughts were on full display because we had to speak the truth? Would it help or would it hurt? Telling the truth is so integral to a culture that's built upon relationship but it comes from the heart of God, because our God is a true speaker. My wife, who sang this song, she's typically over here, but she was over here today. We celebrate 23 years of being married today, all right? She sang this song that God is a man of his word. He keeps his promises. We're going to talk about that today. But in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, the Bible says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, this context of this verse is, a courtroom. Don't commit perjury. But it's so much more than that. It's how we relate with one another. That what we say would be echoed from the heart of God that our God is a true speaker. Now, as we get into the message today, I want to just begin with this illustration. A pastor said to his congregation, he said, ladies and gentlemen, to get prepared for next weekend's message, I need all of you to read Mark chapter 17. Come back ready. It'll help your hearts be prepared for the message. So the following weekend, he asked the question, before we get into the message today, specifically on lying, here's what I'm gonna ask. How many of you read Mark 17? And many raised their hand. He said, the application of this message just took place because there is no Mark 17. <laughs> the Gospel of Mark only has 16 chapters. And for all of you that raised your hand saying you read Mark chapter 17, the application of the message just took place. <laughs> Psalm 116, verse 11, this is not Ed speaking, this is the psalmist David under the inspiration of God would say this, all men are liars. All men are liars. Now for all the ladies in the house are like, <laughs> it's speaking of mankind. So you're included as well. All of us at some point have lied. Thou shalt not lie. If you go, Ed, I've never lied, you're lying right now. <laughs> All of us have fallen short. But here's the target statement. To develop a checkpoint, that's the whole purpose of this message, to develop a checkpoint that something would slow our roll when we speak. Here's the reason why. Because lying is stating something that is not accurate or leaving out something that is accurate. Lying is stating something that's not accurate or leaving out something that is accurate. Now, point number one, write this down. We've already read Exodus 20, verse 16, but I want you to see the truth about lying. The truth about lying. God does not lie. When we talk about the character of God, you'll hear this in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, God never lies. But it's also in Numbers 23, verse 19, the song that Stephanie just sang, that God is a man of his word. Listen to these words. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. 
Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? See, when we talk about the character of God, the character of God is this. He does not lie. And actually, God detests lying. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, God says, there's six things I hate. Oh, by the way, there's one more. Lying. Here's the reason why. Because in John chapter 8, verse 44, the Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. Satan is not the original creator of anything, but the counterfeiter of everything. He takes what God has said, and he twists it, and he tweaks it, and he turns it. Matter of fact, the first sin that takes place in the garden is because of and predicated upon the lying of Satan. Shall you die, Satan would say to Adam and Eve, twisting the words of God. And as we understand this concept of lying, Satan is a liar. And everything he does is for the purpose of your demise. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the ways he does that is through lying because it is the antithesis and complete opposition to the character of God. Now, I want to show you something that maybe you've never seen before in this conversation of the Ten Commandments. Commandment number three and commandment number nine are inextricably connected together. Now, the first portion of the Ten Commandments is summarized, love God. The back portion of the Ten Commandments, love people. We could say in one breath at 140 characters on Twitter, what is the summary of the Ten Commandments? Love God, love people. Love God, love people. The third commandment that says to us, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. It's more than just using OMG or saying OMG or blasphemous phrases in regards to profanity attached to God's word. But listen to this in Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not take up the name of the Lord your God in vain. Do you see how this connects back to what the promise of God would say to us in the ninth commandment? Do not bear false witness or take up false witness, which means to make God's name meaningless or empty. So when we lie, here's what we're saying, that in essence, it's reflecting a lack of a love for God. You go, Ed, that's a little bit weighty today. So when we lie, oftentimes we think that is a personal decision. But God goes, no, I made you for so much more. You're my son, you're my daughter, and you're ambassadors for me. So when you do not let your yes be a yes and your no be a no, you're not only breaking the ninth commandment, but you're also breaking the third commandment because you're taking my name in vain. Why? Because as you lie, you're not representing me because God goes, I'm not a liar. Does that make sense? Come on, can we clap to that today? Can we just see how that connects together? So when we understand the truth about lying, we cannot misuse his name and we cannot misrepresent his name. But point number two, write this down. Not only do we see the truth about lying, but we see the types of lying, the types of lying. There was a moment where a husband who was significantly wealthy said to his wife in his last will and testament, I want to be buried with all my money. That was his request. In my coffin, put my money. So there was a moment where the funeral service took place. The widow, sitting next to her closest friend, in a moment of sympathy and grief, says to her, are you okay? She goes, absolutely. And then she saw this box that she was going to eventually put into the coffin. And her friend said to her, you're not going to put all that cash in that box, are you? And you're definitely not going to put it in the coffin, are you? I mean, it's going to sit in the ground. You could use this. And all of a sudden, she walks up, puts it in the coffin, sits back down. She goes, I cannot believe you did that. She goes, I'm a woman of my word. All of a sudden, she looked at her. That is, her friend looked at her and goes, I'm telling you, you shouldn't have done that. She goes, oh, don't worry. I wrote him a check. <laughs> I wrote him a check. So when we talk about the types of lying, did she lie? You see this hand motion? 
this whole conversation about lying, we, we, we get when somebody was blatant. But it gets a little dicey, does it not? And some of the things of how we navigate through conversations. But I want to just put this in the types of lying. There's what's called miscalculation. It's misinformation. What was given that was shared, you did not intentionally choose to lie. It just wasn't accurate information. Such as, what time is it? And you go, it's 11. But actually your watch was slow. It was 12. You didn't do it on purpose. Silly illustration, but you understand what I'm saying. It's the miscalculation. It was not intentional. But how about distortion? Distortion. We see this all over social media. Your personal bias retells the story. It's not truth. It's your bias of how the scenario and the situation has unfolded. And it's got your slant on it. The moment you put your slant on it, you're distorting the story. How about the word omission? Now, this is intentional. It's the exclusion of details. We were having this conversation last night at the house, eating some Five God burgers. Amen. <laughs> we're having this conversation. This is how this works out at the Newton household. So what did y'all get from the message? This particular section of the scripture, or actually the outline, as we work through the scripture on lying, we went around the table and just looked at this and said to each of our family members, our four children, as we process this conversation, which one do you struggle with? One of the things that was, and I love what my son said. He goes, all of them. <laughs> all of them. I appreciate the honesty. But I particularly look at omission, and here's what happens. Sometimes we don't tell the whole truth. We just tell the half truth, which means we weren't lying in our own mind, but by the fact that we withheld information that was necessary to the story, that's omission we didn't tell the whole truth. We just told the half truth. And God goes, it's lying. Fabrication. It's the addition of information to change one's perspective. The word fabrication means you're adding fabric. You're adding something to it. That's why it's called the word fabrication. How about exaggeration? Making the outcome more favorable. That fish was this big. <laughs> this big. We have a tendency to exaggerate. A situation takes place. We make it so more severe than actually it took place. I walked uphill barefooted in the snow. <laughs> now, I know I'm the only one that struggles with exaggeration. All of us. You see what I just did there? I'm exaggerating. I'm the only one. No, we all wrestle with these things. But minimization, the downplaying of the current reality. So something is being communicated, and by your personal bias, it's minimized. When you go, no, that was pretty significant. What just took place here is a major pivot in how the story goes. But when that major pivot is removed, it's minimized, it's downplayed, God goes, it's not truth. God is passionate about truth. But one of the things that's interesting in regards to lying, the types of lying, is manipulation. Manipulation. The effort of selfish gain by flattery. Now, come on, church. Hashtag real talk. When we seek to butter the biscuit of someone or try to water the seed, whatever analogy you want to use to get what you want, and it's not truth, but you're somehow trying to speak into it to change the outcome, but it's for selfish gain, manipulation. Slander, slander, it's not truth, but yet it's words of accusation that hurt through the means and format of devastation is lying. And God says, I detest lying. Now all of us in this room wrestle with those things. My hope and prayer for you is that you would look not just at an outline and fill in the blanks, but you would go, God, which one do I struggle with? And here's what this would begin to reveal to us. A message like this just causes us to pump the brakes, slow our roll, and be careful of what we say, how we speak one to another. 
how we represent ourselves, not only is the way we represent ourselves, but how we represent God. Third commandment connected to the ninth commandment. But point number three, write this down. We see the tendency for lying. The tendency for lying. Now listen to Leviticus 19, verses 11 and 12. The Bible says, do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name. And so profane the name of your God. See, when we have a tendency to lie, we have to ask the question, why did we lie? What led us to these outcomes of distortion, omission, fabrication, exaggeration, minimization, manipulation? Why did we do those things? Well, selfish outcomes. Hear the word self, self-protection in order to avoid the consequences. A lot of times we lie because we find ourselves caught and we find ourselves now trying to get out of the consequence, so we lie. That's self-protection. Another concept is what's called self-promotion in order to make an impression on others. What's the tendency to lie on a resume? The tendency to lie on a resume is to make yourself better on paper and not trusting the fact that if God wants you to have that job, you're going to get that job. You don't got to stretch nothing. You don't got to add anything to it. Just be you. Just be you. And if you don't get the job because of the fact that you felt less qualified, then here's what I would say to you. Then in the process of you doing the due diligence of making yourself better, then go back and get the training. Go back and do it the right way. Here's the reason why. Because if you got something based upon a lack of integrity, then John Wooden, great basketball coach, would say it this way. Your talent may get you to the top, but only your character can keep you there. So if you had to fabricate something and lie about something to get something, then how about it this way? Your self-promotion eventually will be exposed. As a traveling evangelist, I had an old school preacher tell me this one time. He said, Ed, if you've got to invite yourself to a place to preach, you better invite the Holy Spirit because he didn't get you there. <laughs> what a word that was. See, never invite yourself into a place. Let God do the work. It doesn't mean that you don't demonstrate tenacity, grit, hustle, do whatever you got to do. But work as if it depends on you, but also trust that it depends on God as well. And when you begin to live that way, then we walk in truth and character. But also, one of the ways that we lie, the selfish outcomes, is what's called self-progression. It's in order to gain an advantage or control. Oftentimes, we will lie because of, I need to control the situation. Another tendency of lying is self-provocation. It's in order to punish someone else. They got something, achieved something, or received something that you feel is at the detriment of you. Now watch this. This goes back to stealing from last weekend. And we find ourselves so put off, bitter, hurt people, hurt people, and when we seek to take something or cause damage to someone, it's a direct defense not only to them but to God because you're not trusting God to meet your needs. And so you hurt someone else, but in reality, you're hurting God because God gave them that. And so you can see how all these commandments are connected together. There was a conversation between a mom and a daughter, and they were talking about the commandments and which one was worse, stealing or lying. And the daughter had such a great perspective she said, Mama, I think lying is worse than stealing. Now, the mama corrected this. She said, now, sweetie, listen to me. All sin is sin. No matter what it is, all sin, and somebody needs to hear this today, all sin is equal with God. God does not rank sin. All sin is sin. They just have different consequences. Every sin has a different consequence. So every sin is a direct offense to God. They just have immediate or different consequences. So the mom allowed her daughter to speak this out. Tell me why you say that, sweetie, that you think that lying is more costly than stealing. Here's what happened. The daughter said this. said, Mama, if I steal something, I could take it back and make it right. But if I lie, the damage is done. It was such a profound statement. A rabbi would say it this way. Have you ever seen a dandelion? When you blow a dandelion, the seeds go in places that you cannot find. 
So there's a moment where a rabbi was being slandered by a gentleman. And he said to him in this moment, this gentleman comes to the rabbi and says, would you please forgive me for what I've said about you? He said, would you grab that dandelion? He said, now blow it. He said, son, I need you to hear me. You're forgiven. But just like your slander is this dandelion. Go pick up the seeds of where the dandelion went. He goes, I can't do that. I don't know where they went. He goes, that's exactly what happens when you lie. That you have no idea the recourse and the repercussions. And in the effort to sometimes go make it right, you don't know how far it went. Stealing, you take something, you take it back, if possible. So this teaching for us on lying, I believe, has a lot of gravity to it because we have no idea the full effect of our words, which leads to the sightless outcomes, selfish outcomes. We lie because of self-preservation, self-promotion, etc. But oftentimes when we lie, we don't think about the dandelion effect that causes us to all of a sudden go, where did this end up? Where did the damage take place? Well, here's what the Bible tells us. Your reputation is now tarnished with that person. Not only is your reputation tarnished, but your reliability won't be trusted. And not only that, but relationships are tested. Every relationship is built upon the foundation of trust that stems from communication. Every relationship, professional or personal, is built on the backbone of communication. But in communication, when there's a lack of trust, then we begin to see that reputations are tarnished, reliability won't be trusted, and relationships are tested. So we're called to be truth speakers. Now we get to point number four, write this down. We see the triumph over lying. The triumph over lying. Now, while you're writing this down, now you have to understand when I preach a message, I'm always wrestling with this myself. Is there such a thing as a good lie? A good lie. And before you answer that question in your mind, understand that as I've been wrestling with this and I wrestle with it, I don't know about you, but I talk back to the Bible. I'm like, God, what about Moses' mom? that lied to the servants of Pharaoh to prevent a genocide of the killing of all the boys under the age of two? What about Rahab, the prostitute that was in the town and village, and when Joshua and his men came to spy the land, she hid them, and when the officials of this particular town came looking for Joshua, she said, they're not here. God, what about Corey Tim Boom that's hiding Jewish men and women and girls and boys behind the wall and the Nazi regime is looking for anyone Jewish to lead them to the camp of destruction and death and she lies. Now listen to me. As I've wrestled with this, when we begin to look at lying, lying is lying, but watch this. It's the lesser of two evils. Lesser of two two evils. And I believe according to what I'm studying in Scripture. And once once more, I will never stand on a stage and make it seem as if I am the end-all, be-all on the interpretation of the Bible. I want to encourage you. Always study for yourself. So I'm speaking just out of my own study. I believe there's provisional grace in moments when someone's life can be taken or there's devastation or destruction. And by that moment of not being completely forthright, it's protecting someone else I believe there's provisional grace in that particular situation. Such as, and this is where I got convicted. I mean, I've been all over the world doing some mission trips in places where Christianity is not legal. And I want to get the gospel into that place. I want to go preach Jesus in those jungles. I want to go preach Jesus in those places. But I would never get in at the checkpoint of customs when they asked, what is your business in our country? Tourism. Y'all with me? Tourism. Am I really there for tourism? No. I'm there to preach Jesus. But if I said that, I don't get in. But am I going to sightsee while I'm there? Better believe it. Am I going to buy some trinkets before I leave? Better believe it. Am I going to go see some monuments, learn about the history? Absolutely. So I believe there's provisional grace when there's a greater outcome that's attached to it. That represents truth and honor. That's for free, by the way. Thank y'all for coming. All right? So that did, 
Point number four, we see the triumph over lying. You wrote this down. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Recognize the importance of it. We know John 8, 32. You shall know the truth and the truth shall do what? Set you free. So when you don't lie, by the way, think about how exhausting this is. If we live in perpetual lying, keeping track of all your stories will wear you out. And you don't know who you said what to. And eventually, the Bible says this, be sure your sins will find you out. Can I give you something else to tweet? Here's what I want you to hear today. If you don't deal with your sin privately, God will deal with your sin publicly. I'd rather deal with my issues of all these things and what I'm talking about in my own prayer closet versus God somehow expose me in front of some other people. So you got to deal with your sin privately before God deals with your sin publicly. But when we recognize the importance, the importance of telling the truth, the truth shall set you free. But you go, it did not lead to a favorable outcome. If I just said something different, there should have been a greater means of success. Listen to me. I said it earlier. I'll say it again. But if the means of your success is predicated upon lying, then that is not the right way to get something and do something because the integrity of the moment in which you finally arrived is now tainted by the fact of what you did to get it. I'd rather you live in the freedom of you did it the right way, in truth and integrity. And as you choose to speak truth, it represents integrity, but not only of you, but also God. But watch this. It's also a building block for those around you, especially your children. And so our example unto those around us, our children are listening. It's the note that I got from a church member this morning. It's the moment where we're in the living room, and, and I love the illustration that one of our CBCers shared with me. Phone rang. Is your father there? He's on the other side going, I'm not here. <laughs> so instead, he steps outside, and now the child is able to go, my daddy stepped outside. And what this did in this message from last night caused a cbc -er to go, wow. It's not just in moments in one-on-one -on -one conversation on a resume. It's in every interaction, on the phone, in a text message, on social media. It encompasses everything that we do, especially as Jesus people. Here's the reason why. You know John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is the blueprint for how we're to live. What am I supposed to do as a Jesus follower? Follow his way. How am I supposed to live? Speak truth. And when I choose to speak truth, guess what happens? It brings life. Lying does not bring life. It takes life. And when we begin to walk in this way, we speak truth in love. Now, there are times when your spouse, all you fellows in the room, goes, does this, my dr this dress make me look good? When you pause, you're busted already. There are moments where sometimes you just got to pump the brakes. And I'm just spe spe specifically speaking towards dresses and conversations with our spouses. Sometimes in moments, it's just better not to say anything than anything at all. So you can preserve integrity and character. But I was processing this message. And I want to give you a takeaway because this is the takeaway that's on my refrigerator right now as we speak. It's an original cross stick to someone else, not me, that I'm borrowing to use in this message. The word think, true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. When we speak, ask the question, is it true? When we speak, is it helpful? When we speak, is it inspiring? When we speak, is it necessary? When we speak, is it kind? But watch this. Not only as we speak this to other people, but as we speak to ourselves. I believe there are times that we lie to ourselves. Lie to ourselves. Statements such as, this won't hurt nobody. I'll only do it once. I'll be careful. I can handle it. I can get whatever. I want. We lie to ourselves sometimes. For anybody in the room that's new to CBC, one of the values of our church is we celebrate sobriety in this place. And we do it publicly. We celebrate people that walk away from addictions. And if there's anybody in the room today that has just 
celebrated some sobriety at any level. Because if it's one day, we want to celebrate it. If it's 50 days, we want to celebrate it. If it's 15 years, anybody in the room today that would just go, Ed, I'm celebrating some sobriety in the room today. So proud of you. So proud of you. I believe churches ought to celebrate this story more because if you can go one day, you can go two days. If you go two days, you can go four days. If you can go four days, you can go eight days. But sometimes you just need a place to celebrate that, which is why we have a ministry called Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery. We've been doing this for years for adults, but we're about to launch here soon what's called the landing, which is Celebrate Recovery for teenagers. I mean, we're for real about addiction recovery. We got to help some moms and dads walk through this. But nobody wakes up and goes, I want to be an addict. They lie to themselves. Nobody goes and does hurtful, immoral things. We lie to ourselves. But also understand that the heart of Satan himself is to lie to you. And I've never pretended like I had it all together from this stage. And I hope and pray that this will be the accountability standard that you hold me to 20 plus years from now. That I'd be an individual that stands in front of you and goes, you know what? Yeah, I battle anxiety. Yeah. I battle depression. I hope that Christ would deliver me from that. But as I wrestle with this, it keeps me humble. It allows me not to take myself, myself seriously. <laughs> it causes me to go, okay, God, I need you. I need you. Because nobody's harder on Ed Newton than Ed Newton. But I wrote down some lies that I've said to myself. Because if you're not careful, You'll believe the lies of the enemy. His lies become your lies to yourself. And I want to set somebody free today because I had to preach this message to myself. This is more than just don't lie. It's don't believe the lie, what the enemy's saying to you. And stop taking the lie that the enemy has said about you and make them lies that you say to yourself, such as you don't belong to God. You're not good enough. You don't measure up. You don't deserve forgiveness. You've messed up beyond help or God doesn't care about you or love you. Have you ever said a lie like that to yourself? God goes, that's not from me. Condemnation comes from Satan, but conviction, that's some reflexes right there. Come on, somebody celebrate that right there. That's some reflexes like a ninja. I'm going to drink to that. Amen. And when you and I think about the lies that, that Satan says to us, we got to stop believing them. Stop believing them. I want you to know God loves you. He's got a purpose and plan for you. But we got to think before we speak. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Not just to other people, but come on, to ourselves. To ourselves. Some of the stuff, now listen to me. Some of the stuff that you say to yourself, and I'm preaching at myself, some of the stuff you say to yourself, you'd never say to somebody else. Come on, you got to be kinder to yourself. Speak truth to yourself. This is what God want to say, wants to say to us today. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a brief moment. The truth is all of us need Jesus. The truth is all of us need forgiveness. The truth is, you got to come to a place in your life where you make that decision on your own. And today, if you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus, say this to him. Call on his name. Say these words to him and mean it from the depth of your soul. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer in faith, and it is true that you did that today, would you raise your hand as tall as you can? Anybody in the room today that would say, I gave my life to Jesus today. God bless you. See some hands that are raised. 